1943, the Eastern Front had become a stalemate, with neither the Russians or the Germans able to truly overpower the other. So the German High Command put their hopes in a risky gambit. This was to take advantage of the massive salient around Kursk, stretching 150 miles in total. If they were successful in cutting off the Soviet forces here, they would cause a collapse of the Soviet front line and destroy hundreds of thousands of troops in a single major engagement. Codename Operation Citadel. They believed this could be the key to break the Soviet forces, but unfortunately for them, this was to be history's biggest ever trap. Before the Battle of Kursk could take place, the German High Command, which had chosen to wait to attack instead of using the momentum of previous victories to hit the Russians, this was mainly due to Hitler's decision to wait for the latest German weapons to be involved in the operation, the codename Wunderwaffs, so they quickly began to build up massive forces, some 900,000 men, 10,000 guns and mortars, 2,700 tanks and assault guns and 2,500 aircraft were put together. Not only was this force massive, but it involved many elite units and new supposed wonder weapons like the Panther were being ready to take part in the cursed salient engagement. But the Russians weren't sitting on their hands either. They had learnt about the German plans thanks to British intelligence cracking the German Enigma machine and would not fall back. They began to amass their own grand force consisting of 1.3 million men over 20,000 guns and mortars, 3,600 tanks, 2,650 aircraft, and five reserve field armies of over another half a million men, 1,500 additional tanks. They also supplemented this with massive defensive works to maximise this defensive force. This was about to be one of the biggest engagements in history. The Russian defenders at Kurs had major help in the form of Adolf Hitler making the decision to wait for the new wonder weapons and stall the attack until this time. This gave the Red Army extra time to build some of the most extensive fortifications ever. This consisted firstly of over 1 million anti-personnel and anti-tank landmines, anti-tank ditches, anti-tank obstacles, barbed wire. They also cut down vegetation to make better firing lines and make huge kill boxes. They also dug huge trench networks, altogether stretching a combined total of 2,500 miles. But these weren't the only major works going on at Kursk. Also, 1,800 miles of roads were repaired and upgraded by the massive civilian labour force, which would be hugely important for troop transportation and for the mass amount of logistics the Russian forces would need during the upcoming battles. This massive defence was based on the defence-in-depth form of tactics, which was the perfect counter to the German Blitzkrieg strategy and would cost the Germans dearly. The Russians' fortunes increased even more as they had captured some German prisoners who then informed them that the assault on the cursed salient was to begin on July 5th at 5am. So the Rus Russians decided to preempt this and on July 5th at 2am they opened up with a massive artillery bombardment. This caught the German forces off guard and it wasn't until 4.30am that the Germans regrouped and reorganised their forces for the first stage of their attack. Now the German artillery began to answer back but the Germans' morale had took a hit from the fact that the Russians knew they were coming. Then by 5.30am, air support was sent in, as were the ground forces. The main push, consisting of 500 heavy tanks, supported by medium tanks and not far behind, hundreds of thousands of infantry as well. Their job was to break for the first line of defences. But with the extensive Russian defences, the going was brutal, and within 24 hours, the Germans had suffered 25,000 casualties, and 200 tanks, all self-propelled guns, were immobilised or destroyed, and 200 aircraft were shot down. The Russians themselves took heavy casualties, but they had the numbers and defences on their side and they could take the losses better than the Germans, who had only gained six miles of territory for such heavy losses. Over the next few days leading up to July 10th, the fighting carried on, thick and fast, with the German 9th Army having lost two-thirds of its tanks, and even the heavy panzer divisions armed with Tigers and Panthers were succumbing to the massive amount of Russian anti-tank guns that were placed in overlapping fields of fire, making these areas huge kill boxes. The Soviets also launched a number of counterattacks against the German forces. Even though not totally successful, they did slow the German forces down enough that the Germans had to commit their reserves to the fighting, a bad thing to happen at such an early stage of the operation. Then, on July 12, one of the biggest tank battles of World War II was about to begin at Prohovka. Many do believe this was the biggest, but after my research, this was mainly due to Soviet propaganda and the number of tanks involved on both sides was far less than previously stated but it was still a major part of the Kirk's campaign. The main units involved in the battle was the 1st SS Panzergrenadier Division, Lebster Adolf Hitler, and the 5th Guards Tank Army. 
The number of tanks it is seems to be around 290 for the Germans and around 850 for the Soviets, still a massive amount of armour concentrated into one area. The battle began with a Soviet artillery barrage starting at 6am and by 6.30 the last shells had fallen and the Soviet commander signalled the start of the attack with the code words steel, steel, steel. At this point, 500 Russian T-34s and T-70s began their advance toward the German forces. With tank riders on their decks, they were closing in for the kill. The Soviets had overestimated the German armour strength in the area and took no chances, it seems. And as the Soviets met with the German forces, they quickly overran the Panzer Grenadiers and their lightly armoured half tracks Quickly, seven Panzer IVs moved to engage the Soviet armour, and they were heavily outnumbered, but the T-34s and T-70s were firing on the move, and this hampered their accuracy. But the Soviet tanks pressed on until they hit an anti-tank ditch, which they had previously held the day before, and now the Panzer Grenadier units emerged from their trenches and start to attack the stored tanks began to engage them and the support of the infantry. Then the air support arrived. Both sides flew hundreds of sorties that day, but the Soviets were spread more to the north, and the Germans focused much more on Prohovka, and it cost the Soviet armour dearly. This combined with the good artillery support beat the Soviets back, and in the end the German held their positions. But their forces were exhausted and badly blooded. In total, 43 German tanks were lost, but around 550 Soviet tanks were lost. This was a huge hit to the Soviets, but they could once again take the hit. With their massive reserves on the way, they could then support them. The Soviets had played the long game. Attrition warfare it was, and the Germans were about to start losing it. As the battle for the ground raged on, the fight for the skies intensified with as much ferocity. The Luftwaffe, at this point in the war, was no match for the Soviet Air Force. But with good planning and with their combat experience, they could achieve local air superiority. Even before the battle, the Germans were having issues of short supplies, especially of fuel and lubricants for the aircraft. And any supplies that got there were being delayed by partisans. On the lead up to the battle, of course, the Luftwaffe would normally bomb and raid Soviet airfields to destroy the planes. But the fact the Soviets were building so many, this would make barely a dint in the air force, and the main aim was to control the skies during the actual battle. This was just achieved in some areas, but as Operation Citadel went on, their ability to maintain air superiority dwindled, and eventually the Soviets took control of the skies. There was a silver lining, though, in the fact they had access to some amazing new aircraft, such as the Henschel HS-129 and the Junkers GU-87 Stuka dive bomber, now armed with the board canooned 3.7cm calibre cannon, which turned it into a tank buster, able to penetrate the relatively thin armour on top of tanks. The Soviets also had some new toys to cause carnage in the air, such as the Yakolev Yak-9 and the Lavochkin LA-5, and large use of the IL-2 Stormovic, which the German forces feared for its brutal 23mm dual auto cannons, which could tear through tanks and troops alike. By July 13th, Hitler had officially called off Operation Citadel. It had not achieved its desired goals, and with mounting losses and brutal fighting, the resources needed for it to be successful was just not feasible for the Germans. And the Soviet counterattacks were coming strong. They knew the Germans were getting bogged down, and their momentum was being sapped by the huge defences backed up by the mass Soviet force that they had gathered. This was the beginning of the end for all the gains the Germans had made in this operation, and the fighting officially ended on the 15th in the Kerr salient. And by July 23rd, the Germans had been pushed back to their original starting positions, all the men and resources put into this battle had been in for nothing, and by like July 31st, both sides had taken such heavy losses, and the German casualties were as follows. 165,314 dead, and around 400,000 wounded with minor to major wounds. An estimated 1,200 tanks and assault guns destroyed, or too badly damaged to be repaired, and 681 aircraft destroyed. Also, many of these tanks were high-value tanks, such as Tigers, Panthers, and Ferdinand tank destroyers. But the Russians, even though on the defences, had suffered even higher casualties, with 254,470 killed, 608,833 wounded, 6,064 tanks and assault guns destroyed or heavily damaged, and 2,220 aircraft destroyed or severely damaged, and 5,244 anti-tanks and artillery guns destroyed. This is a staggering amount of men and machines lost between both sides in such a short time span, and it is one of the big bloodiest battles in history. And even more shocking is both sides deployed large amount of veteran and elite forces. These were not mere conscripts or recruits that they lost. These were the cream of the crop and extremely valuable on both sides of the war. The aftermath of the Battle of Kursk was bad for the Germans. This was the last major offensive in the Eastern Front and now their strategy had to switch to the defensive. And to make matters worse, a month and a half later in September, the Allies invaded Italy. The Western Front was now fully in motion 
and forces had to be switched there to assist. The Soviets, on the other hand, could recover from their heavy losses, and now had renewed vigour, and began massive amounts of attacks against the Germans. The Red Army was an unstoppable behemoth that the Germans could only delay, but their days were numbered. Kursk had been an utter failure, and the Germans were about to reap their horrible reward. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please check out my channel, and you guys have a fantastic evening.